From Muhlenberg College, this is 2400 Chew. I'm Tammy Katzoff, and in each episode of this podcast, I talk to one Muhlenberg graduate about their current work and the industry in which that work is done. For this episode, I spoke with Colleen Clark, class of 2002, who is content strategy lead at Airbnb Experiences. At the time of our interview, she had been at Airbnb for only four months. I sat down with Colleen at Airbnb's temporary LA office, located in a WeWork space in Playa Vista. And as I do with all of these interviews, I began the conversation by asking how and when she became interested in her occupation. If there's one thing I wish people had told me in college is that your career is not a a, a linear path. Mm. I think I always felt super nervous and ashamed and freaked out um, that I didn't have like a first step A and then step B and I'm (laughs) going to go to grad school for this and then I know I'm going to get this job. Um, I was an English major. I thought I wanted to do, uh, I thought I wanted to be a professor. I spent my junior year abroad at Oxford University kind of doing the type of schooling that I would have been doing if I had chosen to follow that that path and realized that it was not for me. But then I met some cool people there who introduced me to international health work. So I started using my writing skills to do a lot around like, you know, writing around international health. And I spent a uh, summer in Kenya working at an AIDS outreach clinic. And then after college, I got a job in DC writing about AIDS and reproductive health policy, culture, kind of like anything around those topics. Mm. For whom, whom were you writing for? I was writing for the Kaiser Family Foundation. Oh. So that was kind of my test again, you know, do I want to, maybe I want to get a master's in this and maybe I can do kind of things around, um, at the time it was called social marketing, where you would use the principles of marketing and media to convey different public health messages. So that was kind of something that I, like a, a thing I tried on for a little while. Sure. <laughs> and um, because I, I got to travel a fair amount for that, a job came up at USA Today, an entry-level job, and this was not to date myself, but in kind of the earlier days of newspapers becoming much more digitized. Mm-hmm. And um, because I had you know experience working online for the foundation, because I had done some travel on my own, I was able to talk my way into this entry-level digital journalism job working for the travel section of USA Today. Cool. So there, so if there was a lesson to take from this, there is clearly no linear path to getting into what you're getting into. Yeah. And I know I think it's really hard when people are like, how do I get your job? <laughs> and and there, I, you know, kind of the only answer is remaining curious and being a positive person to work with, Mm. um, being a hard worker, uh, because I think all of those things put me in good stead of the positions I was in and kind of set me up for the positions that I got afterwards. But my position at USA Today is what kind of set me down the path of working in travel media, travel journalism, And I've worked in various permutations of that ever since. Tell us about what you do. What what is your role here? What are your responsibilities? Yep. I work in content strategy for Airbnb. Content strategy means a lot of different things right now in the industry. So it can mean anything from content marketing. So while I was at TripAdvisor, I ran their luxury travel site, Chatsetter. The goal there was to use storytelling, whether that's like editorial or social media, video, to use storytelling to actually help sell a product. So mm-hmm. you see this now with J. Crew. You see it with Glossier. Does an amazing job of it. A lot of the major brands are using storytelling and using kind of like this organic connection with an audience to build brand affinity and also to help sell products. So right. for me, I was using that to sell hotel rooms um, at, its, at its simplest form. Right. And then at Airbnb, content strategy, and, and I would say in the broader tech space, Content strategy is a relatively new field. It is working a lot with UX, business development, designers, operations. The idea is to use words to solve business problems. So content strategy, Airbnb specifically, revolves a lot around using language, using UX writing to make things clearer on the website, to make transactions easier. So that's kind of the the really technical side of things. Um, thinking through how to use language to merchandise things. So there's tens of millions of uh, listings and how do you use language to describe what those listings are and then break them up in a database and then figure out how to surface them to users. So it's a real meeting of kind of logic and language together. 
that's kind of what it means at Airbnb. But at the same time, there, you know, there's there's content strategy roles at Facebook, at Amazon. A lot of the really big tech companies are investing in this. And and what they're finding is really the power of language in terms of in terms of transaction. So, mm. you know, the, it, there can be something as simple as changing the words on a on a button on a website and it will completely change your conversion rate and make you significantly more money. So wow. if anyone ever tells you an English major can't make you any money, they're lying. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think I think more and more people are really understanding the importance of, of words and, and how using those words can really help build your business. When I was starting off my career, I thought you kind of like trained for one thing and then you just continued to rise through the ranks of that. Mm-hmm. I graduated in 2002, so right after the first tech bubble burst, and before kind of the second burst, right, right. the lesson that I've really learned is that all of the jobs that I've had didn't exist years before. With each new job that I've gotten, I've kind of, there's no been no clear path as to what the next thing could be. Right. You know, when I was working in media, I was I started at USA Today, and then I was at Connie Nest Traveler's site, concierge.com. You know, I could have moved up from associate editor to, you know, senior editor to editor-in-chief someday. Mm -hmm. And that is 100% one career path. But for me, I think the most interesting thing has been figuring out what are the new ways that we can use storytelling to move a business forward. I think Mm -hmm. it's that kind of meeting of content and commerce that has kind of fueled my interest career-wise. So I did start in traditional journalism. I started at a big newspaper and I kind of was starting there helping them figure out how do we change our business to adapt to this new digital age? Mm. When I moved into magazines, magazines were kind of a few years behind newspapers. So when I started at Connie Nast, like they didn't really want to have blogs and they, they, you know, social media was just kind of like becoming a big thing. Right. And so wow. I kind of was there during that big sea change for them. And then after that, I did freelance travel writing for several years and then kind of use what I was learning through doing that and started at TripAdvisor. And that was kind of when we started to see a real trend of people using content to sell things. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of as I was moving into this role at Airbnb and sort of do I want to move into this more, this role that has a lot of like technical requirements and and, and capabilities. It's definitely using a whole other part of my brain. For me, it kind of represented a new place where like storytelling and language and words, that's kind of a new, a new field, a new kind of uncharted territory that I thought sounded really interesting. Yeah. Sounds interesting to me. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about your days here. Who do you work with? What, what's your team like? It sounds like you don't have a typical day, but what are some of the things you would do in a day? Yeah, so I, I can actually take the past couple of months um, as an example. Uh, one of the coolest parts about a content strategy role is that it's really cross-functional. So I'm working with kind of the smartest of the smart people in their respective fields at the mm-hmm. organization. So I might sit down with a designer trying to figure out, uh, we just launched this thing called Airbnb Adventures, which is multi-day adventures around the world. And I would sit down with the marketing team and we would, I, I would say like, this is what I think the messaging for Airbnb Adventures should be. Mm. This is what, you know, I think the user should should learn. And this is how the messaging is going to work on the website. This is how the messaging is going to work in email. This is how the messaging is going to work in terms of how we merchandise the different trips on the website. And marketing would say, okay, that's really helpful information to understand how this Adventures product is going to work. Here's what we're thinking of, of doing for our campaign. And then we would work together to be sure the messaging was consistent across the documentary that we're filming and the social videos that we're creating and the photographers we're sending out around the world. And so, you know, we create sort of a central like book of truth for what the messaging for a particular product will be. Uh, and then we help kind of shepherd that through all the different parts of the business where that's going to bear out. So it might be meeting with marketing to sort of figure out, like, if that's the message, then how does that work in this documentary we're making? Mm. It might also be meeting with, for example, some of our UX designers because they'll be at some point thousands of different trips. So right off the bat, we need to think about how are we tagging those trips? What are we creating in sort of like a database in the back end so that when we're building the site further down, Mm -hmm. that the information can be readily organized and reorganized and localized and personalized (laughs) so that when you go to search for an adventure, it's already been tagged with, let's say it's a food trip to Peru. It's already been tagged with food and Peru and all the different things that you do on that trip, whether it's 
visiting a jungle or visiting a farm or, you know, taking a cooking class, that that piece of kind of information that we sort of thought through all the different ways that we might want to use it in the future and that we're kind of creating this really robust back end of, of information. So mm-hmm. so that's a, that's another way that, you know, I might contribute during the day. So, and then, you know, we can work with the product team and figure out like, okay, now we know we're building this web page, like we're building this page. How is the copy going to look on the page? And how do we, how do we understand how the different components of the page are going to work based on whether we know your geolocation or not? So there's, there's all these like important considerations um, Mm -hmm. around how the language gets used through all of the different touch points that a customer sees. So Mm -hmm. it's a really new field. Um, it's definitely not for people who, you know, only want to write long form, you know, beautiful <laughs> novels right. pros. or, or pros. prose. Yeah. Um, you definitely have to one, be super like comfortable working cross functionally Two, not be super precious about your words because everyone has an opinion on them. Uh, <laughs> And, and three, also, um, you know, sort of be able to, to walk that line between having kind of a very logical process oriented brain, but also a creative brain. And I think that's a really interesting place to be operating. Mm. One of the really interesting things about working at Airbnb is that it's a company started by and run by an artist. And I think that makes it much different from working at pretty much any of the other major tech companies. Brian Chesky, went to the Rhode Island School of Design. He is the son of a social worker. Mm. He has a, like a, a really interesting and unique point of view when it comes to how one runs a company. And so working in a creative or artistic field at Airbnb is very different from anywhere else because you have someone running the company who really wants to get into the weeds on the creative aspects of it. So he really gets into things around like the colors of the page, the textures of the photographs, the, wow. the kind of like the, the language that you're using to sell the product. And, and it, that can be really challenging. <laughs> uh, it can be really challenging to have feedback from that high up mm-hmm. to move quickly, but it, it's also incredibly fulfilling because it means that the company really invests heavily in the creative aspects of the business. Mm-hmm. Like they really do, see the value in storytelling. I think it's one of the core aspects of the business is Mm -hmm. is storytelling. And what it ladders up to is the company's mission to help people feel like they can belong anywhere. And that was kind of what ultimately sold me on working for Airbnb. That kind of, it really aligns with what my whole career has been about, which is travel, making the world feel smaller for people, making people feel more connected. And so the, the mission of the business, which is like connecting people through homes or, or any type of travel experiences, making people feel like they can belong, feel connected. I mean, that, that is kind of the mission of language and, and storytelling. And sure. so I think working in a content field at a business that is really aligned with, with what your field is all about is a really special and rare thing to find. I feel like I kind of remember when I first became aware of Airbnb and I was like, Oh, this is cool. And it seemed like a really simple concept, like kind of an obvious concept. Why not do that? But I feel like, like in that short period of time, this company has evolved so much. And I think that's really a testament to the visionary nature of the leadership. I know, frankly, when I first found out about it, I thought, I'm not going to stay in a strange person's home. Like, (laughs) I'm a single woman traveling by myself to a foreign country. That seems really dangerous. But I think what's really cool, what they have proven out through the business is kind of what the lesson I have learned through my years of being a travel writer, which is the world is a lot less of a scary place than you kind of are led to believe when you're growing up. You know, it's like, don't talk to strangers and... You know, there's a lot of, <laughs> all mm. these reasons to be scared, but there's actually way more reasons to be comfortable in the world and mm-hmm. to be to, to really connect with people. And I think what I've learned just by being lucky enough to use my career to travel and write is there's more people that are going to help you than not. And there's more beautiful, kind, amazing souls out there than you could ever even imagine. And I think what's really cool about Airbnb is that they've created a platform for people to, to actually come to that conclusion on their own. You know, I think. There was a time where we would never have dreamed of going, booking a trip to South Africa and staying on some strange person's, you know, in some strange person's apartment. Mm-hmm. And what happened for me by doing, by taking trips like that is, is that I met people and had access to culture in ways that I would never have had staying at a hotel before. The reason I'm excited to be a part of this company at this time and its growth is that I'm working on Airbnb experiences, which is 
things to do in places around the world. And mm-hmm. the, it's a similar thing where it's led by locals. So you can go to a dinner party at someone's really cool house in Barcelona and learn how to make paella in their backyard and meet their friends. Wow. And it's all of the ways that you kind of like, at least that I dream about connecting with people when I travel. Mm-hmm. And this is sort of facilitating it for a wider traveling public. And so it's a really exciting time to be a part of this business. And it's an exciting role to have within this business. With the rapidly changing everything about this business, you know, media, social and otherwise, technology, what does Airbnb do and what is Airbnb going to have to do to stay at the forefront? So I think... They really understood from the beginning the importance of storytelling. Like, I think in a lot of ways, if you've worked in media, you know that the first thing to get cut is the thing that seems the fluffiest. And Mm -hmm. oftentimes people think that that is good photography, good words. Why keep the senior person when you can have the intern run the whole the whole business? <laughs> I saw that happen in, at a lot of companies I've worked for. But what has been consistent about Airbnb throughout since their founding is that they've invested in storytelling from the beginning. You know, when they were just a couple guys working out of an apartment in San Francisco, they were actually sending professional photographers out to shoot Airbnbs. And that was long credited as one of the reasons why their company took off is because they invested in making this prospect of staying at a stranger's house a lot less scary because it had these really beautiful, clean, professional, well-done photos. Mm. So presentation matters and, and storytelling really matters. And I think their insistence on always looking for ways to connect with their audience. I mean, it's a massive company. <laughs> like, millions and millions and millions of people are staying in Airbnbs mm-hmm. and, and millions and millions of people are hosting people in their own homes. And it could be really easy as the business scales to start to lose that sense of personal connection. And I think what they always come back to is the storytelling, is finding the people and telling the stories of the people who are using their products mm-hmm. in really smart and truly sincere and heartfelt ways. And so I think it's a real honor to get to help find and tell those stories. Since you started, what do you think have been some of your biggest challenges or the biggest hurdles you had to get over? So content strategy is a new field and there's kind of no way to really prepare yourself for success in it. There's a small handful of books, which I read during the interview process. Books? What's a book? (laughs) There's not, honestly, not even that many articles. And it's such a different field from company to company. So what Mm -hmm. Amazon might need from a content strategist, which might just be writing the copy on buttons, purchase buttons, or things as simple as just like the headlines, Mm. that might be what a content strategist does at one company. So it really is hard to prepare. That was a big challenge for me. You know, I kind of like to come into things, particularly roles that are challenging with people that I admire. I really wanted to come into it guns blazing. And I think the thing that I had to accept was that the first couple months are just blindly trying, <laughs> just trying to keep your head <laughs> above to water. Keep up. Yeah. And, and everyone knows that like, it's, it's kind of a known thing that it's like a couple of, it's a, it really is a couple of months of just like trial and error and trial and error. And, you know, it was the first time for me working really closely with UX designers. So learning the language that they use and this is one of those times where when you're a fish out of water, being a someone that works in communications really comes in handy mm. because it's my job to be able to use language to break through things. And so I think working with engineers and working with UX designers, which was like definitely like a totally new language for me, it helped to be confident in my ability to kind of like break those communication barriers down and and try to find out like what's the vocabulary that they're using like how can I how can I break down this problem that I'm trying to solve in a way that kind of makes sense for their concerns their day-to-day work their jobs so that's been a big challenge the second challenge is everyone thinks they can write (laughs) so when you go from some of the smaller organizations I worked for to a company this big I'm working on you know some projects that are that were very high profile. And because they were high profile, everyone wants to give input. And Mm. so it is really challenging to write for lots of different opinions and points of view. And while you may need buy-in from a head of marketing and a head of design and the CEO and the VP of the business, all of those people are coming at a piece of copy from a different place. Mm -hmm. And so it is very challenging to maintain a voice, maintain a really clear voice that is consistent across all of the different touch points, Mm. but to also tell a clear story 
always keep the user in mind first because ultimately we're not writing it for any one of those people. We're writing it for a user right. and a lot of users. And so, you know, sort of thinking through, like, how do you maintain the voice of the product and maintain the voice of the company? And then also kind of take in all this input from, from people who are extremely smart. Like, they have, they have reasons to be making the requests that they're making. But you end up kind of, like, being in this role of almost, like, diplomat of trying to figure out, like, mm. take all of these, like, competing ideas and figure out how to synthesize them into something that still makes sense, still has a sense of storytelling and voice. So I found that to be one of the bigger challenges of working here, but also a cool challenge. Like it's definitely pushing my writing in ways that I would not have expected. So what has been your strategy to get through that? I mean, did you actually have to sit down and think, okay, how am I going to do this? What, what is the most effective way? <laughs> Honestly, it's a lot of trial and error. So there's stuff that's as practical as, as actually creating spreadsheets of like who is allowed to have input and in what uh -huh. capacity. So you know, before you try to be really inclusive and say, like, I'd love to hear everyone's opinions. I want to hear people's thoughts on things. And then you get too many of them and you realize, oh, my God, this is a disaster. I can never <laughs> I can never make all these people happy. And so I started creating these charts where depending on people's roles, they were allowed to give certain types of feedback at certain points in the process and generally related to their role within the company. So if, if you're a legal person or if you're in safety and compliance, like you get to have input on the legal aspects and that's it. If you don't <laughs> like a verb, I don't care. <laughs> that makes total sense. That's so, so logical. Yeah. So, that, so that's one way from a, from a very practical, like process oriented perspective. Mm -hmm. And then I think the other way to tackle it is, I think the best way to do it is creating good PR for yourself. Like I think content strategy is a new field. And so nobody really knows what it's supposed to be. So kind of one of the benefits is that you get to define that. Mm. And so I think you have to build up positive sen sentiment at the company. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I tried really hard to come to people from their point of view, you know, like ask what their needs were, what problems they were trying to solve from a business perspective, because an engineer is going to have a different concern than a, than a marketing person, than a designer. And so putting yourself in someone's shoes and figure out like what part of the business are you trying to solve? Um, because words are going to be a part of all of that. Like mm. words are part of every part of every business problem people are trying to solve. Mm. And so, you know, coming at it from what's your point of view? What problem are you trying to solve? How can I help you? And so that ends up kind of pulling down some barriers in mm. terms of, oh, she's trying to mess with my stuff or she doesn't understand this crazy engineering problem we're trying to solve. And and the reality is I actually don't need to understand the full engineering problem. I need to understand like how I can help, how my part helps you. Right, right. So I think building up a good sense of team spirit and, and showing that your heart's in the right place is mm. that that's just an, a good lesson regardless of where mm -hmm. you work. Mm -hmm. And then I also think um, doing good PR for yourself. So I think a lot of times, and I've noticed this particularly with women in the workplace, like a reticence to really sing your own praises. And I think it's really important to be super clear about the impact that you're having on an organization. Mm. Tech is for sure a very male dominated environment. And I think I find a great sense of responsibility in clearly articulating what I'm bringing to the table, mm. the impact that my work has on the greater business. And I think that that's, it's a responsibility I take really seriously. And it's a responsibility that if you take it on, makes your job a lot easier in the long run because people aren't going to like look for what, what did the, what did that small copy change that she did? How did that impact our conversion or something? You know, it, that's, it's not their job to figure that out. It's my job to kind of show the worth of content strategy and how it can, you know, materially impact what we're doing, what we're trying to do at Airbnb. So that's been kind of the third way that I've worked through those problems is being a champion for content strategists and yeah. for the other people on my team. Advocate for your profession. Yep. <laughs> Cool. What do you think has been one of your proudest or most gratifying moments since you started here? So we just launched Airbnb Adventures, and they are multi-day trips around the world, led largely by locals. For me, I spent my whole career in, well, almost my whole career in travel writing. And I've always looked for those, like, really, like, fundamental connections that you can make when you're traveling. And they're, I think, very hard for your average traveler to make, particularly mm. in an age now where we just have so much information. It's really hard to plan a trip now, even like as a professional, mm. like who's been doing this her whole professional life. I find it hard to plan trips because there's just too much information. 
And, and, you, and once you're there, you never have to talk to a local because yes. you've got you've got your that, phone and yeah. <laughs> you're, you're looking at Instagram tags yeah. and locations. And I just find it really overwhelming. And I think it was really gratifying to work on this project because I think it's it's a product that allows people to reconnect in a really profound way with the destinations that they're traveling to. It kind of cuts out the middleman instead of feeling like, oh, this tour guide from who knows where is taking me to see this famous destination. Instead, you're connecting with people who like actually live there and you're allowing them to tell the story of where they live as opposed to an outsider coming in and taking you on this tour. And so I was really proud to work on that project. One, because it's helping more people travel the way that I really love to travel and helping people to connect in a much deeper and more profound way. But the work was just also really interesting. It's It was one of the biggest new launches for Airbnb as a company. And I had to figure out, how do you tell that story? What are the most important aspects of this to really bring forward? There's a million cool things about it. And mm. how do you really tell the story of why this is important and why people want to do this? How do you find the personal stories in it to really make this resonate with people? You can write a lot of great taglines and marketing copy and stuff. But what's really going to resonate is how travels like truly change people's lives. And we created a documentary. We sent six strangers around the world from different places around the world on a trip. We didn't tell them where they were going, all different ages and um, backgrounds and people who had never been on an adventure trip in their life. This documentary, it really is a testament to, as mini doc is, is a really a testament to the power of travel to really transform people. Mm. And, you know, they're one of the gentlemen on the the video has since moved to an entirely different city. And, you know, I think like people, people have made like profound shifts in their life based on kind of like what they discovered about themselves and about mm -hmm. a destination by going on this trip. And that transformative power of travel, I think I found it in my own life. Um, I found it when I studied abroad in England and, and realized that I needed to take a whole new path. I have found it multiple times, you know, on trips of my own. And I mm -hmm. think Getting to work on a product, you know, I know it's it's commerce. I know I'm selling things. I know I'm not changing the world. Um, but for me, I, I do fundamentally believe in, in the transformative power of travel. And I mm -hmm. think getting to work on something that makes that more accessible to people was really fulfilling. For someone who might want to do what you do, what would you advise them to do? <laughs> Getting into content strategy right now, um, because it's a new field, there's there's no linear path in. It can be everything from, so my background is, in, is very much an editorial. Mm -hmm. I worked in magazines. I worked in digital video. I've run editorial sites. I've written guidebooks. So that, that's kind of how I came at it. And then I kind of diversified my skill set by working for digital media companies, learning a lot about social media marketing and content marketing and how to combine those sort of like content and commerce needs. But I didn't have any background in UX. And so that has been my challenge is to like when I was interviewing at Airbnb, they said, obviously, yes, you have all of the experience in the world on the travel and content and storytelling mm -hmm. side. How do you prove to us that you can that you can work on really complicated UX problems? And so that was my barrier to <laughs> climb right. over. But I think that that is actually just a lesson of the job marketplace these days. You can't actually fully prepare in college, in internships, early in your career. You can't actually predict what uh, you can't actually predict what the path ahead is going to be. Of course. And yeah. so I think the the most important lesson that I've learned time and time again is. Being curious, like, you know, not just kind of settling into your industry, you know, always like taking the opportunity to be networking, you know, I read the Harvard Business Review, mm -hmm. I read like a lot of the trade publications, um, just to like understand what are the broader kind of trends that are at work right now. Mm -hmm. Where does my role fit into this like larger picture of, of where business and industry is going? So I think that's one thing I would say is just like really remain curious. I, I would also say be completely shameless about reaching out to people. I've, you know, early in my career when I knew nobody, I did I didn't come from a media family, neither mm -hmm. of my parents went to college. So I, I didn't have a built-in network to reach out to. And so I was kind of blindly after college, just like throwing anything at the wall, showing up in person to offices, you know, to hand in my resume. Um wow. like I used to do you know. that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I would look at the masthead on a magazine, um, which is where they list you know, the names of the different people, the different editors and creative people. And I would guess what their email address might be and cold email them and, and just say, like, can I take you out for a cup of coffee? 
Did that ever? It did. So <laughs> oh, wow. I got one of my first writing assignments by doing that. They had never met me. They had never seen a piece of writing I had ever done. But I asked them out for coffee and we had a great conversation. And she said, I think you're smart. Here's an assignment. Wow. So and and that I, I you know, I've I've found that to work again and again. And, you know, both creating those opportunities for yourself, creating those sort of personal relationships and then also maintaining them. Mm-hmm. That's one of the most important lessons is like LinkedIn and stuff makes it a lot easier. But really committing to maintaining those relationships on a practical level in terms of how you can get into content strategy. I think, you know, it's it's really about getting a broad base of experience. So you can enter into a role like this coming from a product background. So you could you could be in more of like a, a tech product role at a, at a tech company and be a good writer. Mm-hmm. So that's one way that people have gotten into a role like this. Um, you can kind of take that route I took, which was you have more of like a content, social media marketing or some sort of like writing background, but maybe you have a really like strong sense of logic and and business development and stuff like that can also kind of get you into this field. Mm-hmm. But I think when it comes down to it, yeah, it's, it's really just about creating good relationships, working hard, remaining curious. Mm. Um, I know that's like a really frustrating answer when you're, yeah. when you're, when you're starting off your career, you want there to be like a really like clear set. Oh, like of I course. follow ABC. Of and- course. Yeah. I tell <laughs> all the students that I work with that it doesn't happen. And that's doesn't what happen. I wanted desperately. Like when I, when I was graduating, I was so nervous and I just like wanted to find a great job. And I, I wanted to know that, you know, I, I think up until you graduate from college or grad school, it's, there's always like a clear path to success. Like if I study really hard and I work for my SATs, I feel like I, I will know that next I can get into a college. Mm -hmm. And then if I work really, really hard in college, I can get a good internship. And that's always the hope. Like that, that's always kind of like what you're set up to believe. Sure. Whether or not that's true based on like socioeconomic background and, Mm -hmm. and And so many other resources and luck and all that stuff, like whether or not that's actually true can be debated, but, but you are kind of led to believe that. And I think the real challenge for me when I was graduating from college was, I don't actually know what to do now to be successful. And so I, it was a real challenge to accept that there was actually no clear, straightforward path. But what's also really cool on the flip side now being many more years into my career is looking back and realizing like, thank God there was no clear path because I could <laughs> never have known to end up here. And right. I would never have dreamed big enough to think that I could get paid to travel the world and write about it. Mm-hmm. And I, I would never have thought to think that big. And I think just the sort of small steps along the way of like, well, I guess I don't want to do international health work. I guess I'll do try to write headlines for this newspaper. And then I did that. And it's like, well, I guess I'm kind of good at this. Maybe I could work for a magazine. I don't know. It always felt a little aimless and bumbling at the beginning. Mm. But the real kind of like long term impact when you kind of like add up consistent hard work, consistent sort of interpersonal skills and positivity, consistent curiosity, like though, if you can remain consistent in those things and in building those relationships and, and in like, kind of like constantly, you know, sort of figuring out the next step for yourself, like mm-hmm. it adds up to a really fulfilling career in the long term. And I think just be comfortable with the uncertainty now because it <laughs> pays off in the long term. <laughs> This episode of 2400 Chew was produced by me, Tammy Katzoff, Associate Director of the Muhlenberg College Career Center. It was recorded on location by Paul Kremposky and engineered by Morgan Wolper at the studios of WMUH Allentown, Pennsylvania. Our opening and closing music from Cowboy Bebop is performed by the Muhlenberg College Jazz Big Band.